Hi everyone, welcome to edition five of the Trusted Seed Spotlight. And we have a very special guest today. I don't think I can do a proper introduction, so I'm just gonna say hello, Zargam. Thanks for joining us on the Trusted Seed Spotlight. Tell us a little bit about where where did you grow up? Where did you come from? And how did you end up down the token engineering or create maybe the token engineering rabbit hole and come to find or help to create the common stack? Um, I guess where I grew up, I, I grew up in upstate New York. So like Albany area, um, Troy actually was the name of the town. Um, it's like a old sort of in, industrial revolution era area with a little bit of a resurgence around the universities in the um, in this region. And so, um, yeah, I grew up there and then I, I liked the sort of outdoors and hiking and went to college in at Dartmouth, which is up in the woods also. It's sort of Northeast US. And I guess that's sort of the geographic background. Tell us a little bit about your studies and maybe how uh, some of that journey from your academic life into creating block science. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, well, my I journey was block. pretty 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 wandery, rambly. I um when I was quite young, I started taking sort of like well, my grandmother was a math teacher, so I was sort of a, a math nerd before I understood that the puzzles I were solving were math problems. So I I did um sort of most of the traditional college math like calculus, multivariable calculus, differential equations when I was a high school student. And so I, then I like went and worked on some aerospace materials at a startup. And so I kind of had this weird like pre-college sort of, oh, like here's how science work. Here's how using science to do engineering works. Here's how you use math to help you design things. And so having worked on aerospace materials as like a 17 year old, I went to college and then actually kind of continued to work on a little bit of um, material science. And I got suckered into a bit more um, robotics, mathematics, control theory, and, um, started working on some, I took game theory in the government department at, at Dartmouth. I did some agent-based modeling and like kind of started to get my hands dirty with a mixture of mathematical modeling, mathematical design and actually consulting. And I guess you could say that's sort of the origin story. The path from there was meandering between consulting projects and doing my PhD at Penn and working on robots and nuts and bolts of it is most of what I learned, I learned by doing in some capacity or another, but I like meandered across fields, which gave me a lot of perspective um, on the application of science, engineering, and mathematics to problem solving. Like finished my PhD, went into industry because I was a little leery of the sort of removedness of the academic perspective on on real real world systems and like to do a lot of really like large scale data driven decision making with a lot of money on the line kind of led to a okay cool this whole signal processing control theory math brain thing plus real world business decision making is you know not just an academic exercise. Um, some of these concepts from you know robotics and control theory really do work in a you know business or economic context. And uh, eventually, I moved on to found block science um, because I wanted to sort of expand and build out that practice at the interface between okay, like the deeper, more theoretical tooling that comes from my background academically with the real world uh, cases. And so that's that's how I got from I guess. We went all the way from I grew up in Troy to I have a company called Block Science where we do basically operations research or like applied ecosystem um, like management. Wow, we just took a big leap in time there. So um, when, did you first hear about, when did you first hear about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology? I first heard about blockchain and cryptocurrency in like 2014, got involved in my first crypto related project in 2015. I helped launch a project in 2016 um, and largely, you know, I got some like hands on time with uh, that was a Bitcoin core fork. It was a cult, like a, it was pretty crazy to kind of get a feel for the, the actual tech. Um, I really got into more of the, the economic components sort of after that when I 
um, started to recognize the uh, relationships between uh, sort of blockchains and in particular smart contracts with the um, what in control theory is embedded control or like low level control where you enforce rules and variants through some mechanism that's really close to you know, instantaneous or close to real time, but then the higher order systems that you build, the you know, the bridges and power grids and whatever else is, they they get built up on top of these sort of guarantees that come from the low level sort of micro control or low level invariant enforcing. And so, I think in 2018, I published the first paper on on blockchain economics that I wrote, the first one I wrote, and that was um, really just a expression of the relationship between standard form mathematical models for state space dynamical systems to what we observe in blockchains and sort of this you know statement that you can use invariant based you know logics whether it's a no double spend um, in bitcoin or a more general invariant um, we call them like value functions or invariant functions um, you can get things like the uniswaps and balancers or bonding curves. They, they actually tie back to some low level mathematical invariant enforcement, which actually mirrors real, the real world systems um, pretty surprisingly closely if you have experience with them. So I guess that's the answer. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think there's so many threads to take from that, but I guess what's maybe interesting or a uh, kind of concept or term that a lot of people haven't heard is token physics. And I think you're somewhat referring to it. I mean, there's a lot of different things you're referring to there, but can you talk a little bit about, yeah, token physics and, and when you were cool. talking about variants? So okay, Jeff see? should get credit for calling it token physics. But the idea mm -hmm. was that when we're working on these tokenized systems, the the, what you're often doing is you're engineering the, the conservation constraints or declaring them. In fact, they kind of already exist. If you reason about the system, you're like, oh, it really makes sense for us to understand where the conserved flows are or the rules about how value enters or leaves a particular subsystem. So in engineering, you deal a lot with interfaces and you have often very open systems. Like you might define a closed system where you control the inflows and outflows, but in reality, we don't fully control those inflows and outflows because there's humans. And so we can kind of describe the rules of how information flows in and out of the system. We can't actually describe exactly how it flows. So you relinquish the sort of assumption that you know what people are gonna do in favor of describing laws of motion. And so this term laws of motion is borrowed from physics where we talk about the way in which the system evolves in time according to the laws of motion, which preserve the conservation constraints. So mass and energy are conserved, right? These are concepts that underpin physics. And if you look at your economic systems as, well, let's declare our physics so that we can sort of build up from those physics rules or those laws of motion to properties that we can have, you know, strong expectations about. We're in this completely open design space and we need something to orient to. So is this kind of, is this where some of the initial thoughts came from around token engineering? I mean, I don't think you meant and everyone was sitting around going, let's invent token engineering, but tell us how that happened or how you saw this, yeah. this field kind of emerging from these right. conversations. So, so my experience with the, the token engineering term even was that I want to say it was 2018 and Trent and I were in New York talking about this and we were talking about Lyapunov functions and some other, he's also a PhD in electrical engineering. So we have some shared relatively advanced math context. So don't be scared. Okay, Lyapunov functions, yay. So we're talking about this like math equipment. Lyapunov functions have this energy-like character, which makes them good analogies for this discussion. Um, and I, what I remember about this conversation was that like I was like, no, 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 it's economic systems engineering. He's like, no, no, no it's token engineering. And, he, <laughs> and the the case that he made that totally like made it work for me was that in electrical engineering, the carriers of information are electrons. So you have electrical engineering where like electricity or electrons carry information and you build systems as electrical engineer that are comprised of many things other than just electricity. But like the term that we have chosen to use was electrical engineering and it contains, you know, a wide range of signal processing, control theory, whatever, that is often at least bundled under or adjacent to EE, electrical. Um, and so token engineering sort of manifested as, well, tokens carry information. They're representations of information flowing through a system. And so if we, if, 
if these software systems on these you know distributed networks with these you know wide range of economic activities occurring are going to be reasoned about as information systems like economies are information systems then although i was inclined towards economic systems engineering i was sold on this notion of token engineering on the grounds that the tokens are the units of information or the 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 things that carry information that they flow around but um Anyway, that's a that's a thought on where the term comes from. I'm still partial to thinking in terms of economic systems, but now I think of the economic systems as like an even greater umbrella that like an economic system may or may not include tokens. And often if we're doing token engineering, we could be token engineering a subsystem of a broader economic system in the same way that I might be electrical engineering a subsystem in a in a robot where the robot level is still like the goal setting level, which is higher order system but um we could necessarily step in and ask okay what's the tokenized part of this and how do i do the token engineering component of my system or my uh, my economic system and so why do you think uh i mean of course analogies these analogies with that electrical engineering are fantastic to communicate a lot of the, these ideas why do you think this work is so important or what do you see as missing from kind of the mainstream dialogue um, about how we're looking at systems engineering and, and what do you see in the space that's um, kind oh, of a challenge? Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> probably have to go through this a few things. So let's start with systems engineering is equipped with um, tools for composition and scalability in the compositional sense. Like you, you combine things and they retain properties. This is a necessary attribute of, you know, these crypto systems because they're designed in this permissionless way and they compose freely. And so you need things that are going to be safe under arbitrary future composition. And so this notion of validation and verification and the separation of the inward looking verification, did I implement the thing I intended to implement? You're testing, you're testing sort of with this inward looking. I specified it, I implemented it. The implementation matches the specification. Validation is a little bit more outward looking. It has to do with like, did I implement the right thing or does the thing I made fit into the next system above it? So like, it's like part whole, it, it relates to this sort of parts and holes thing. And so we, I think that on one hand, we just need to understand the difference between that inward looking verification and that outward looking validation. Um, and so on one hand, engineering helps with this. Um, I tend to use this analogy of the robot that's smashing into a wall. But if you look at the data inside the robot, the robot might tell you that it's where it wants to be. But if you can see it smashing into the wall, you know that you need to go back and like, you know, do some work on it until it achieves your goal in the outward looking sense. Um, it's a little, it's a little bit of a toy, like it's not a perfect analogy, but it's, it's helpful. Um, the next thing besides validation and verification is, um, maybe less engineering per se, but more institutional where we say like, okay, but what's a successful system look like? Well, we can only really evaluate that somewhat ethnographically. And for me, this is a, a, an attachment to engineering the um, the social system or engineering the value system. Like we say, what do engineers value? Well, they, they're they responsible for safeguarding the public good. They have um, sort of expertise that they apply in, in, in the effort to preserve that public good. They manage the complexity of technologies that end users can't realistically be expected to totally understand on their own, but it makes it possible, their engineers make it possible for people to consume that technology without having to themselves become experts. And I think this is actually pretty important from an infrastructure perspective. If you had to understand how every road and bridge you drove on, how every power grid that you plugged into, how the internet that you connected to really worked, every one of those things all the way to the point where you could, for yourself decide in an informed way whether or not to participate in that infrastructure, you would never do anything because you'd spend your entire life just trying to catch up on all of the infrastructures that you rely on. And my opinion is that in Web3 that we necessarily have to provide some of that abstraction to end users, but that the only way to realistically do that is to have a, a social institution that is taking on the responsibility for actually making it safe for someone to use that infrastructure. So, so that's one element of the, of the concept of engineering or why I think engineering is important. And then lastly, and this is actually a bit more on the technical front, I think there's actually a ton of untapped potential in the, in the, in the engineering discipline that's 
as yet largely under applied in crypto. Um, one thing is the vast majority of digital signal processing, which is a sub branch of EE, is all computationally constrained like math. It's like it, it, it amounts to doing computations with limited amounts of information to solve or enforce um, sort of, again, we talked about invariance before, but um, the simple fact that we don't have good fixed point libraries on blockchain networks tells me that people haven't done the background research on the existing fields. Like if you want, um, you know, the approximations of real numbers, which are, um, stored in fixed number of bits and worked with without wasting lots of space, um, you should be using rationals. And people use rationals, but they use really, you know, comparatively inefficient rationals in these decimal-like data types instead of things like, you know, Q number format or other sort of, uh, we'll say like up-to-date um, fixed point representations. And like, that's not like, rocket science it's just like a thing that i don't think people have encountered because it its origins come from people working on things like microcontrollers where you have a piece of hardware that's pretty limited in its capacity but it needs to solve a math problem in real time or you deal with things like sensor networks where you're gathering lots of noisy messy information and trying to integrate it into some collective information that's used for maybe some decision making and a lot of that stuff is just analogous to the kinds of problems that we're facing in blockchain. Maybe it's approximate in that we might have to refactor it a little bit in order to make it fit our needs. But the truth is, there's a lot still to be mined. And I think it comes in part from the fact that the most of the inbounds into the space, we've got lawyers and we've got um, economists and we've got computer scientists and we've got lots of people. But the engineering discipline is this role of sort of um, you know, applying technology and that these mechanical and electrical engineers and, you know, power systems engineers and, and you know, cyber physical systems engineers who deal with these kinds of, you know, networked com computationally constrained infrastructures have tools and toolkits that like have yet to be exposed or integrated into, um, into the, the crypto world. And I think that both the attraction of new engineers, as well as, um, you know, honestly, like bringing engineers in from the existing engineering fields could facilitate the knowledge transfer required to continue to mine that intellectual capital and apply it in a shorter term than it would happen if we had to reinvent all that stuff. Hmm, that's interesting. I was going to bring up, I think what's really unique or cool about this area is the transdisciplinary nature and all these po polymaths behind us. But can we break for a second? Can you tell me who is that behind you? Oh, this is Fathom. Uh, <laughs> Fathom? Fathom, Fathom is um, Kirsten and my dog. Really, Fathom is Kirsten's dog, but she shares. <laughs> so yeah, if I can ask you a little more personally, you know, uh, I think a lot of people would be curious I was kind of joking the other day, like, I wonder when you look at the world, is it like Beautiful Mind where you see things like pigeons walking in algorithms or you even speak in shapes to me. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about when, you know, how you, how it looks through the your lens oh, or gosh. your brain work or when, the, when the there's world a, a sucks. Problem. I, I, so I've had this problem since I was quite young is that like, because I, whatever it is that my brain does, like I am constantly feel, I feel constantly overwhelmed by how much of a kludge the world is, but not in that like, you know, micro sense in like in a very macro way. I just feel like I look at the world and it's like, you see the matrix, but you can't change it actually. You can see it and you're like, oh, that's how it works. And you're like, oh, like what am I gonna do about this? But then instead of like magically moving it around, you just smash your face against the wall. And sometimes it changes a little bit and you just gotta be like willing to keep smashing your face against it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I guess what do you what is I always kind of in my philosophical explorations or listening to some you know kind of enlightened masters or things, I still struggle to think about like determinism versus the fact that we actually are consciously creating. Since we're on that thread, uh, what are your what are your thoughts around this? I kind um, of like your description. Yeah, so so that's interesting. So the way that you can at least the way that I think about this is that I sort of 
don't care whether the universe is deterministic or not because I don't think that we could we could tell the difference. So like in a weird sense, because of the way complexity works, the way that emergence works, if the world worked on deterministic rules, we would still have a, an extremely minimal capacity to project it. And so like we experience it as non-deterministic regardless of whether it's deterministic or not. So at that point, does it really matter? Well, yeah, I guess this is a good segue to looking at CAD CAD modeling and simulations. And I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts around, you know, what is the highest leverage work that we can be doing? And I would love to hear also a little bit of your thoughts around simulations and speaking about, you know, when we observe um, how this could potentially change the outcome or when we're projecting that we actually create yeah. what it is that we're projecting. Um, are you can are you familiar with this concept of second order cybernetics? Like, is first of cybernetics and then second order cybernetics. But sort of cybernetics is essentially um, social systems applied, you know, control theory or social systems applied systems theory, like general systems theory. So you're thinking about the way the system evolves or the way the system co-evolves, and then you're building models and refining your understanding of it. And so cybernetics is this field. There's some, you know. I would just say look up the literature. But then there is this concept of second order cybernetics, which sort of examines the role of the cybernetics, or it's, you know, Margaret Mead calls it the cybernetics of cybernetics, where you're like examining the way the interventions themselves are part of the system. They're not, you're not actually an external adver observer. You are only ever participating in the system and kind of co steering it. I like, um, Danello Meadows talks about dancing with systems. So you're never like really, you're not puppet stringing systems ever. You're like at best you're dancing with them because they're going to react to and with you often in ways that you don't expect. So you would, you know, there's this um, relatively famous concepts attributable to, I think uh, Merton about like unintended consequences of purposeful social action. So whenever you like come up with your great policy and you implement it and like, you know, something different happens, like almost inevitably, because you can't possibly think of all of the feedback paths that could be consequences of your intervention. So like, you know, obviously what we're doing is trying to create a higher degree of fidelity in our visibility into the consequences of our policymaking. And in particular, treating algorithms as policymaking, because you're actually just setting the rules about how people interact or saying, if you do this, then that will happen. And that is ultimately policymaking. And so if we, it, it look at algorithm design as policy making and you know algorithm modification as governance then effectively we're just saying look we can build some tools to help us have let's just say like due diligence in the design and modification of these things and give us some visibility so that we can steer and then ultimately the highest leverage work to answer your question is teaching people to be informed participants in 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 put in, in these sort of permissionless digital systems so you're like cool great we have a new kind of digital democracy thing where you show up and you opt into a system you start doing stuff you participate and you start co-steering with all of the other participants and you may have varying levels of influence knowledge expertise etc but it turns out that none of those systems can really function if people are just random they're actually it's actually important that those people bring information private preferences private observations real life experience and like the system's job is really to help synthesize that and to sort of say, bring people together to accomplish shared goals, but it can't do that if people don't participate in a minimally informed way in their day to day. And honestly, in an even more informed way when it comes to any sort of governance decision making. So I guess the reason for CAD CAD and the, the sort of meta modeling technique of saying, I know I don't know this stuff. What are the wide range of things that might happen given these things I know that I don't know? It's really just there to help unlock this let's have a productive discussion, but like, let's have a scientifically informed productive in a discussion and try to come to some decisions and like recognize and manage trade-offs and all that messy social stuff that it turns out as part of physical systems engineering anyway, it's just that most people who only ever experience the consumption of infrastructure aren't actually exposed to all that messy governance crap that has to happen somewhere behind the scenes, whether you're the CTO of an internet service provider or whether, which 
my, my, my um, former boss, one of my mentors is, or whether you're the, um, my, my dad's the director of design quality for the Department of Transportation in New York State. So again, like, all right, so what's the, what's the deal? Like, what are we building? What are we repairing? Like, what are the, um, what are the requirements before we're allowed to go do this thing? And what are the stakeholders, you know, governor wants blah, blah, blah. And the, there's all of the shits going on and ultimately someone has to make subjective design choices. Someone has to make um, sign off. Someone has to budget what we're going to build and what we're not going to build or route funding to maintenance instead of building new shiny things. All that shit happens in transportation networks in power grids in, um, you know, yeah, you get the idea. So my point here is that like, we don't get the liberty of pretending like governance doesn't exist just because we're doing technical stuff. Um, and this is true of engineering past, not just of engineering future. And I think maybe the real rub here is that there's still room to do better. Like, I'm not saying that those things are done particularly well. In fact, they're kind of a cluster. And the issue is that we can't get away from the necessity by pretending it doesn't exist. On the other hand, like being more informed, being more participatory, you know, being permissionless means giving people a pathway to become informed and a pathway to participate once they are informed. It's also not the same as just saying everyone's opinion is equal and let's have a like a beauty contest to see whose opinion gets to ride because that's also pretty shitty. So anyway, I, it's the opposite of a solution. I'm really just sort of describing this necessity of the emergence of a of a social institution, which I think of as the engineering profession or the engineering institution, where we say, cool, all these decisions need to get made and these things need to be stood up and maintained. And like, ultimately with this public good in mind, not necessarily, um, you know, how am I gonna make more money? Because if I only use my skills to figure out how I can make more money, there's a good chance that I'm pushing the system in the opposite direction of safe and sustainable for, you know, an everyday user. Yeah. So basically, yeah, we can't predict outcomes, but we can make more informed choices if I'm hearing you. And then just that the important part is the visibility and the chance to see under the hood if you want to. As well as, um, yeah. yeah, just that, you get a, uh, a sweep of potential more, consequences. We like, can make we can make more conscious decisions and intentional decisions based on that information. Yeah, it's sort of like with, so just to kind of tee in a, a CAD CAD even, like CAD CAD is about, is, is sort of the marriage of agent based models and system dynamics models and sort of concepts in signal processing and control. And it's really just like a, a meta tool that helps you follow an epistemologically sound evaluation. It acknowledges the model is not, in fact, the real thing and says, like, cool, up to changes in my model up to changes in my assumption how sensitive are my conclusions so that you know i don't go make a model that tells the story i want everyone to see and just say hey look it works and then it doesn't work instead we're like under what circumstances does it work are those circumstances realistic like maybe they're you know it's like it's a little bit more boundaries oriented it's it's what if with the acknowledgement that even the what if is just a computational thought experiment and it's in service of the design, in service of the governance. And this is actually already how we do most of the computer modeling and computer aided design um, in, in any other um, infrastructural context. It's not a perfect map of reality, even in a physical system. It's an approximation. All models are wrong. Some are useful. That's Box, George Box. And then on top of that, I would add that they're useful to some end. So, like, they're, you know, what you are trying to accomplish affects whether or not the model is useful. It can be useful to achieve one end, but not useful to achieve another. And we talked a little bit about what's kind of going wrong or, or ha that hasn't been examined or employed in blockchain and crypto. But what do you see that is inspiring that is going very right right now? Um, I think the the best thing is just the the like sheer volume of really like talented individuals. I think we have a lot of room to better understand you know historical like literature and integrate it and to cross disciplines and break them down. But that's already happening. So I'm not saying like I certainly don't think it's bad. I just think it's really young. I mean, any new field, honestly. <laughs> the internet is young by human society standards. And this I consider to be just a part of the maturation of the relationship between 
humans and computation. Because I mean, like when you think about it, physical machines are computation with matter. Like you get to the point, so you get simple machines, like even ancient, you know, pulleys and levers and stuff. You're accomplishing tasks that you can't accomplish with, um, you know, your bare hands by creating stuff that helps you do it and, you know, takes away some of the steps. And we were doing this with increasingly advanced technologies and on increasingly vast um, scales, like spatial scales, and that our relationship as a society with the technology of the type computer, and in particular with the distributed network that is the internet is really immature. And so if anything, that's not immature, crypto's immature, that's immature, you know, human society's relationship with computers is immature. And we see that in the way that AI is used. We see that in the way that, um, you know, all sorts of technologies are being employed to, um, you know, let's say divide or control people. And I am hopeful that crypto is a pathway or it's the, it's the trailhead to using computers to like, you know, unite and empower people rather than to sort of like divide and control people. And if I can say you recently had your first child who we welcomed into the community, has this changed your views on anything or affected your work at all? Um, surprisingly little. I think, yeah, I'm more, yeah, I'm more inclined to think about it from the perspective of the, the world that she would, you know, grow up in and live in and so on. But Overall, I don't know that it's changed my outlook that much. It, maybe it just puts more urgency on it. It's like the same perception of the world, but now I have you know more skin in the game in, in the in the future sense. Like you know, at present, I'm like, well, this sucks. I want, I want it to be different, so I'm going to try to make it different. And then at now with Conrad, um, I'm like, okay, well, this sucks. I want it to be different for her and for you know you know, potentially her kids and so on. There's a little bit more urgency to it, I would say. Stories and narratives are so powerful in creating. So what is the best, most bright picture, maybe a little bit realistic of what you could paint for a future that is better? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm like weirdly, like pessimistic short term and optimistic long term like i'm generally of the opinion that we're entering this sort of are really are have already entered pretty like trying geopolitical times because i see you know largely you know corporate entities taking on the roles of governance you've got like pl large platforms like the you know the fang companies up starting to fulfill critical functions I would historically attribute to governments in the sense that they take your data and they tell you what you can and can't do and then you just deal with it. Um, and yet they have no democratic components. There's no like feedback loop. They have a fiduciary duty, not a duty to public good. And so they do whatever is going to make their shareholders more money. And to me, that's kind of icky. And I actually as much as I'm not the hugest fan of the, the current state of the state, I'm, I'm like, I would argue that um, those big corporations are actually more dangerous in their slow displacement of states fulfilling state-like functions than even, you know, comparatively inept democratic states. Like, I'd rather have a democratic state or a social democracy of some kind than a, you know, a corporatocracy or a technocrat technocracy. And then, like, the crypto slice is sort of giving me a perspective on, you know, well, what happens, what is the Pareto point between something that is maybe somewhat dated and seemingly inept, and then you've got something maybe more capable, but also fundamentally very centralized and they're, they're again, that fiduciary duty component of a corporation basically tells you that their job is not to take care of you. Their job is to take care of their shareholders. And ultimately, if they can take care of their shareholders by taking care of you, they will, but they're really not beholden to you. And so, you know, the <laughs> those, they, those to me seem like maybe there are like opposing uh, dystopian tracks that are like, one is like, 
devolving states and the other is you know supercharged corporations and that you know there's this bright light in the in the growing participatory sort of permissionless open source plus plus that's coming out of the crypto um exploration space or this like you know frontier in economic space where we're exploring you know political arrangements we're starting economic relationships the interplay between economic and political arrangements contracts automation you know subjectivity objectivity trade-offs like you know there's just lots of cool frontier so i guess the best way to think about it is that my bright light is just that there's this portal, you know, to go a Westworld style, the land beyond is through that portal. The problem is we can't actually see through it. So we're just kind of like, well, that way kind of sucks and that way kind of sucks. And maybe some aspects of both are good if we can retain them, but that we need to, you know, keep trying to find new territory in cyberspace to kind of this frontier or settle this frontier. and the best worst part about this is that like we just don't know all we can do is co-create it and it could be worse than either of the other two things if we if we allow it to be or it could be so much better and back to i guess our discussion about determinism i'm like even if it's deterministic we don't know all we can do is go like try our best to co-create it and if that if those acts are deterministic then again how would you know so to to wrap up, I guess, and thinking that we all are influencing each other. And if anyone watches this, do you have any advice or thoughts, parting thoughts or advice for the community? I guess my, 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 one of my favorite phrases is mind the epistemic gap. So minding the epistemic gap is about understanding that no matter what mental model you have, it's a model. And because it's a model, it's wrong. And because of that, it has some you know gap to reality. Like there's some aspect of reality that's underrepresented in your mental model. This it manifests as false dichotomies or false equivalences or all sorts of you know logical breakdowns, but it's all contextual. At the end of the day, you need models. You can only ever make decisions. You can, whether they're advanced computational models or just simple heuristics in your brain, you're like, always, if you're going to make a decision, you need a model. Even if you don't think you have a model, you do. It might be implicit. And that making or trying to make your models explicit so that you can think critically about them can help. It helps eliminate bias in AI algorithms. It helps uh, eliminate pitfalls in your own life's decision making. And so like, no matter what you do, just try to think about what decision you're going to make or what data you're looking at or what experiences you're having. Like try to back out the mental model or whatever the model it is that you're using and like subject it to criticism and just be aware that it will inevitably have some strengths and weaknesses and take into account those strengths and weaknesses when you apply it to make a decision. And that's just like, I guess, super abstract decision theory heuristic, but being willing to be like reflexive and sort of critical of your own mental models can really limit um, pitfalls. Okay, mind the epistemic gap. I feel like we need a t-shirt for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Zargo, for joining me today for this edition of the Trusted Seed Spotlight. Thank you. Have a good one.